Thanks. So welcome to this presentation. Today we're going to talk about uh, Axeway transformation to the cloud. Uh, so this is not a technical presentation. Uh, we're just going to go through uh, the change transformation we did from uh, an organization standpoint, uh, from a DevOps and the cloud, moving to the cloud. So I will start with uh, this high-level presentation, and uh, Vince will uh, continue with uh, going into more details uh, from a DevOps standpoint. So anyone ever heard about Axeway? Raise your hand. A few people from GitLab, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, uh, we are not very well known, but uh, it's a quite interesting company. Uh, historically, we are a, a software, on-premise software vendor, uh, and we are specialized in integration patterns, such as you know, B2B, message file transfer, and, and API gateway. And, and interestingly enough, we are here to provide you know, the tools for uh, transformation of our customer. Um, so, uh, and we did our own transformation, you know, starting in 2015, and we're going to talk about that. So, uh, what we do, what our product do is about, uh, to give you an example, when you connect to your smartphone and, and try to get your bank account information, uh, we've got all the, the API gateway to securely connect to your information. Uh, or, you know, if you do a, a wire transfer, uh, from one account to another, uh, we've got this kind of new application in the back end that does this transaction uh, and make it secure. So, you know, we've got you know, a lot of customers worldwide. We've been around for uh, 15 years, uh, and we've got nine out of the 10 uh, biggest banks uh, in the world. So, uh, we're kind of you know, spread out, uh, and uh, we've got to run your know, 2,000 employees worldwide. Um, so, our transformation started in 2015, um, and we onboarded you know, new leadership, uh, and they made an assessment of where we stand. So uh, what we realized is we were working in silo. Uh, we had a, a development organization, a QA organization, a product management organization, tech writer, you name it. Uh, we had separate you know, organization. And you know, having that you know, creates a, a lot of you know, uh, lack of collaboration, a lot of frustration. Uh, and each organization has you know, different objectives, different priorities, and going different direction. So this is you know, related to a, a lack of trust, a lot of collaboration, and, uh, and the status quo in everything we were doing. Uh, and you know, obviously we are not doing any kind of continuous in improvement, uh, and we are going nowhere. So in addition to that, you know, we've been going through a lot of acquisition along the year, and we had a lot of product. And we were investing the same amount of money on every single product, regardless if it was an end-of-life product or if it was a new, innovative, new strategic product for us. So we had to change that. And again, it was due to a lot of acquisition over the time and the fact that we had this miscommunication and lack of collaboration in the organization. So the first thing that really kicked everything up was your support and sponsorship from uh, executive team. You know, if you don't have that, it's kind of difficult to make a change in any organization. And I think it was critical for us to, uh, to kick that up. So the first transformation we did uh, was around tooling. So uh, tooling is not a driver to a transformation, but it's really an enhancer of what you want to do. And it's really a key to your success. And you really have to define what you want to do with your tooling. What we realized before is everybody has different tools. There was no collaboration. It was difficult to maintain and so on. So uh, what we said is we set up the requirements for those tools about what we want to achieve. And one of the first things we, we wanted to do is about open policy. Uh, regardless if it was in your uh, GitLab, where, where we've been using, or Jira, uh, that was our selection. Uh, it was about open policy. So everybody has access to the tool and everybody can contribute to the backlog, to the source code and so on, which was not the case before. So we did the change from uh, historically CVS, SVN to GitLab and to, uh, from version one to uh, Jira for the backlog management. And the selection of GitLab at that time in 2015 uh, keep in mind, by the way, they didn't have any issue management in GitLab, so it was mostly around source code control. Uh, and, and the selection was about a, a better modern system, a modern tool, a DVCS, because we are quite distributed. And we wanted to have a central 
uh, location for everyone to, to contribute. <coughs> Another reason why we selected GitLab was uh, they provided an on-premise solution. We were working with the government, and at that time, uh, we couldn't have our source code on the cloud. So we installed your GitLab uh, on-premise. And you know, finally, uh, in order to have a good adoption, you know, the, the selection process and requirement came from our developers. You know, it, it's really the fact that we empower our team to provide inputs about what they wanted to use uh, helped you know, the adoption of GitLab. Uh, and we purchased GitLab in 2015, and six months after, you know, we had every single source code move from SVN to GitLab. Uh, and the adoption was you know, very fast and, and easy to do. So, um, you know, organization uh, structure, Alex Way, was very hierarchical. Uh, and you know, your organization charts represent the culture of your enterprise. Uh, and we have to change that. So the expectation for the manager was uh, no longer to review, validate, and decide for everything, but really about empowering the team and ask them to understand what they were doing, questioning what we were doing, and so on. So, you know, the first transformation about you know, the job was uh, around product management and, and the team. Uh, we used to have uh, two product managers for one product owner and one product owner for 42 engineers. And that didn't work too well because we didn't have any enough product owner uh, you know, uh, resources to really drive the team. So we changed that and we put in one uh, product manager PO uh, for 15 engineers uh, to improve the autonomy and the reactivity uh, of the team. <coughs> Another interesting ch move uh, we've done is we removed the product manager and the product owner for the product end of life. Because what we realize is if you set up a, a product manager on a product, uh, you're gonna have, it's gonna drive you know, the, the backlog. It's gonna drive the need of resources and, and the cost of this product. So taking away product manager from end of life product help us now to refocus on the strategic product and just set up a, a sustaining team for this out-of-life product. And finally, uh, we set up a you know, uh, self-empowered team. Uh, and by that, I mean that the development team, we use a two-pizza concept, right, small one. Uh, but we had the QA resource, we had the development resource, we have the security resource, we have the tech writer in the team. All those different activities in one organization, in one team, uh, to deliver value to the customer. Uh, and what we've done in parallel is to create a center of excellence, uh, meaning we have a small group in parallel for uh, security, a product security group that were here to not you know, write security code. It was owned by the development team, uh, but more about providing guidance, providing uh, expertise, providing security gates to make sure that every product going out of R&D was secure and validated and so on. So we did, you know, we changed it completely the, the way it was set up, uh, and it worked pretty well. And, and finally, we did, uh, you know, technology transformation. Uh, we had some pretty old product, uh, monolithic. We got some probably five million lines of code, and we quickly realized that we could not you know, rewrite everything, but we set, you know, new guidelines. Everything had to be DevOps. Everything had to be microservices, and everything had to be cloud ready, on cloud first on all the new development. Meaning that DevOps, we introduced you know, GitLab, uh, Jenkins, uh, uh, test, unit test, you, uh, functional test, everything was automated. Uh, Micro services for new development, so we had more uh, flexibility. And cloud first, so everything had to be on the cloud, was supposed to be easy to upgrade, easy to deploy, and so on. So we changed the mindset of what we were de developing. And, but at the end of the day, you can change you know, everything in an organization, the process, the architecture, the structure, but what's most difficult to change and what's, what takes over is a culture. And a culture change is the most challenging to do, and it took a couple of years to get where we are. And in 2015, we were only on-premise software. 
like I showed you initially, you know, in H1 of 2019, we had a 17% growth on the cloud, and more than half of our revenue is now on the cloud. Um, so it, it took some time. It took you know, five years to get where we are, and we're still you know, working on it. But culture is key part of this transformation. And Vince is uh, going to talk a bit more in details about how we made this change from a culture ch ch standpoint, sorry, and from a DevOps standpoint. Awesome. Thanks so much, Eric. And thanks, GitLab. I really appreciate the cool swag. Uh, this really saved me today because I brought a t-shirt to talk into. And uh, this is fantastic. I've been nice and toasty. So got one button here. We came up with this question, how do you change culture, when we looked at how we delivered software. And when you're coming from an ISV that's used to traditional software delivery for on-premise product, that's quarterly deliveries, sometimes semi-annual deliveries. You want to go to cloud native and SaaS where you're delivering every day. That requires a complete mind shift change and a culture change at your company. And this was the question that we came up with. How do you change culture? Show of hands, has anybody read The Lean Enterprise by Humble, Molesky, or O'Reilly? OK, a couple. OK, so you guys, are in on, you guys are in on the secret. You start with behaviors. And you start with behaviors because what we do is, and, and who we are, and how we want to behave, and how we expect each other to behave influences how we feel. It influences our values, our attitudes about our job, and ultimately, that influences culture. So we have a simple acronym here. So as we went on uh, our cultural transformation to become more of a DevOps type organization on our journey to the cloud, we decided we wanted to keep CALMS. And CALMS stands for culture, automation, lean, measure, and probably most importantly, sharing. So in the next few slides, I'm going to show you how we automate for continuous delivery and really have an eye on continuous deployment. We're lean. And in being lean, we continue to drive a culture of learning, which helps us become more lean. How we measure DevOps at Axway, and most importantly, how we share. Has anybody ever heard of the Dora Report? OK, good, few hands here. That's the DevOps Research Assessment Report. It's been published for about the last five years. Um, it's somebody that loves to lead DevOps type teams as well as development teams. I've carefully followed this report. They've surveyed over 30,000 people over the last five years. They've gathered a lot of data and they've put together great metrics around software delivery and operational performance. And so the things that we looked, started looking at at the beginning of uh, 2019 were lead time to change, deployment frequency, change failure rate, mean time to restore, and availability. And these cross all three quadrants of really your value chain when you go to build a SaaS product, software development, software deployment, and operations. So before we get to how we measure in 2019, I, I want to say with how we started in 2018. I, I mentioned that earlier. We started as a company that was delivering software quarterly. Um, we had the opportunity to build our first SaaS product in-house, not through acquisition. So we really had to retool our thinking and our behaviors in order to change our culture. Where we started in 2018 was probably around a medium uh, performer between once per week and once per month. Uh, we did start developing cloud native services. They allowed us to develop a little bit faster, but we were still really limited by the end of the sprint. So we were delivering software at the end of each sprint, which was every two weeks. And if we missed that, then it was the, at the end of the month. Um, lead time for changes, definitely between a week and a month. Uh, time to restore service, we're still less than a day, which is good. Um, and our change failure rate was actually higher. Uh, we were probably higher than 15%. Um, we just didn't have a good grasp of, of how things worked in a distributed world. Our first foray into distributed system in SaaS was on Docker Swarm. So a lot of intervention and, and uh, a lot of heavy lifting by our teams focusing on infrastructure and how that worked and not really focused on the product. But 
we set the goal of being an elite organization for 2019. By the end of 2019, we made it to high. And we, we touched in some of the elite categories, but we, we only assessed as high because that's where we could perform consistently. And so we were consistently deploying between once, once per hour and, and once per day, most of the time two to three times a day. Um, between one day and one week was our lead time for change. That's what it still is today. Our time to restore service um, within two hours. So that, that was fantastic. And our change fury rate is definitely, it's less than 15%. So by the end of 2019, we, we did a fantastic job. Uh, it's, it's really, really hard to make that type of a movement uh, in one year. Going to elite, yeah, we want to set those wild goals. And that's great because the team can look back and reflect and see what we did and how we can get better. I'm going to go into that in the next few slides on, on some of the other behaviors within Calms. So where do we want to be for 2020? We're still aiming there. And I'm going to go over some of the behaviors and our lessons learned about how we're going to get there. Uh, just to recap, if you want to be an elite, part of the elite performing team, you're deploying on demand in the background uh, multiple times per day. Your lead time for changes is probably our hardest one. It's going to be less than an hour. And how we measure that is from commit into the master branch to when that change flows all the way into operation. Uh, time to restore service, this will be a lot less than our SLA, will be less than an hour. Um, and the change failure rate, still on par, less than 15%. I like this slide. Um, it kind of shows the stages of evolution as to what are some of the outcomes and then what are some of the behaviors. So if you look at stage two, that's probably where we were in 2018. Um, we were just getting started, uh, lifting and shifting in the cloud. We had complicated rollbacks, not a lot of service ownership amongst the teams, um, some outages, lots of manual steps. 2019, much less outages, fewer manual steps, and hours to deploy. We were on track about 10 to 20 deployments per month. To become an elite performer, that's, as I mentioned, deploying continuously in the background, minimal to no outages, no manual steps in, in, in your value chain, in your pipeline, over 100 deployments per month. So let's talk about automation, because that's one of the behaviors within Calms. Um, what we wanted to do was automate and empower our development teams and trust them with making the changes that would affect production all in one shot by providing tools that automate for scale, right? So these tools that we build, um, they need to be self-service. They need to have the capability and the resources so that development teams can take these tools and do their work without somebody setting them up and helping them out and you know, basically a lot of care and feed along the way. It, if you want your development teams to run you know, the sonar scans, the internal quality checks, external quality tests, all the aut automated test frameworks, static and dynamic security scans, it needs to work like any good product and service, period. And one of the game-changing things that we did from a DevOps team perspective was we started treating our tools like products for our development team and we hired a product owner. And that product owner was a game changer. Um, why? It, we, we really started treating our tools like products. Um, we started eating our own dog food. Uh, don't get me wrong, we leverage a lot of third party tools. I'll show you this on the next slide. But really it's a synthesis of these tools in, in your value stream and that is the product itself, that synthesis that's responsible for reliably delivering your product in a SaaS environment. Um, the other real great benefit of having a product owner on a DevOps team is the ability to bridge across other teams with their product owners or TPMs and understand what changes need to be made. Getting the feedback from development teams, operations team, and security. Really heading that up and, and rolling that into the tools allowing us to communicate better. This is an eye chart, but it's kind of like a 10,000 foot view of our CI and CD workflow, and it's there to show you all the different tools that we go through. On the left is CI, on the right is CD. Just some high level points here. You know, we want our, our goals with CI were common local development environments and pipelines they could use, common CI paths, a common image registry, and a dashboard with 
basically build and vulnerability reports so that teams can get feedback on whether their code had security violations or quality issues. On the CD side, some of our objectives were basically immutable infrastructure and automated deployment tools for those. Common CD paths, so if a development team member wants to build and deploy microservice and use the CD path to go from QA into prod, they get a common pipeline that allows them to do that. Uh, we use Jenkins to do a lot of these things. Like I said, if you notice here, a lot of tool sprawl. Um, one of the things that we learned here in 2019 is that traceability was difficult. It's difficult when you have to go across all these different tools, especially when you're going from Jenkins back into GitLab, there's a lot of link diving. Um, and so the feedback we got from the development teams was, you know, the visibility with CD is good because you could see the end-to-end -end pipeline flow and see where things break in CD. But if you want the entire visibility of your value chain from CI through CD, it's difficult. It's hard to track changes back in from Jenkins into, into GitLab, lots of link diving in, as I had mentioned. Um, and so they weren't getting the feedback fast enough, right? They were getting some visibility, but they had to work for that feedback. And that was great feedback that we learned. Um, we learned at about 15 microservices, the complexity became a little bit much for Jenkins to handle. We kept having to add inputs into the jobs, and uh, when teams would go in and try to use it, it got hard to use. This is one of my favorite slides about uh, keeping calms and lean. Um, this is in Rio 2016, uh, so we're coming up in Tokyo 2020. Does anybody know what happened here? They dropped it, exactly. This is a dropped handoff. How many people here have had a dropped handoff from dev to ops or dev to security or security to ops I mean, that's pretty much why DevOps exists, right? It's these silos that we have to break down. And there are a lot of parallels in our journey to the cloud. We had poor handoffs. We learned from our mistakes. Uh, we had to really work together as one team, not only just working together, but practicing together, right? And understanding how things work. And really, I would say most importantly from a cultural perspective, seeking to understand before you really understood, and that's a habit from you know seven habits, but really trying to understand the other team's perspective before you recommend a solution, because oftentimes you're both trying to do the same thing, you're just articulating it in a different way. And uh, that requires a lot of patience on the team's parts to do that. Um, this team actually ended up winning gold, even though they dropped this, because they found that you know another team had bumped them, they got a second chance to rerun the race, I'm sure they practiced like hell to make sure that they weren't going to drop that baton, and they won gold. Same type of thing that we have to do as, as part of uh, our journey to the cloud. Um, as Eric mentioned earlier, we have all a lot of the cross-functional aspects of the team, so we are more aware as a team and more empowered as a team to own services all the way into production. It's just not one whole team of developers. We have quality points of contact, DevOps points of contact, security points of contact. Sharing. Probably one of the most important behaviors if you want to go to a pure SaaS organization um, and you want to operate as one team, sharing is critical and the only way that we've found that sharing really works um, at a high operating level is by providing visibility and providing transparency through dashboards and visibility in your tools. Um, so I talked about the Dora report earlier. This is how we implemented that. This is a service level view. We've also implemented organizational level view. Um, we'd like to open source it because we think it's really useful. Uh, we have the APIs built for GitLab. Uh, if we're interested, you know, we'll, we can talk afterwards. But basically measures our deployment frequency, and you can adjust the time scale. This is on a per month basis. So for this microservice, we have about 25 microservices in our one product. Uh, 19 deployments, lead time to change is about a day and a half. Our mean time to recovery is 12 minutes. Uh, change failure rate is, is 5%, and our availability is within our SLO. So this 
allows our teams to have the transparency as to how other teams are doing with regard to some of these metrics and help each other out, right? If, if I expect a feature to come from a team that has an SLO that's breached their SLO for the service, they're probably gonna have to work on their stability for a while before that feature is gonna come out. So it also gives you the visibility as to what they're gonna be working on. I have in there blame, no blame. Uh, we implement a blameless culture. Uh, this is critical. This is basically one of the most impactful things when things go wrong that you operate as one team and no finger pointing. Really seeking to learn what happened. And I know we talk about root cause analysis. A lot of times there just isn't a root cause. There's so many different things that happen in that context of that change um, that there's lots of causes. And there's no finger pointing. The goal is really to learn and understand how we can improve our technical systems, our processes, uh, or even our organization on, on, on how to repair those, those, those items. Basically, you don't want to have broken handoffs. That's where outages occur. So for 2020, um, based on what we learned in 2019, here are some of the technical and behavioral changes that we're going to be making uh, in our CI and CD. Uh, and this is from the 10,000 foot view. First thing we're gonna do, based on developer feedback, is move all of our CI pipelines from Jenkins into GitLab. And the reason why we're doing this, as we touched upon it earlier, is we want better visibility and faster feedback loops for developers and application code. We don't want Jenkins link diving. Um, developers are super happy about that. We're gonna be moving from a CI ops model to a GitOps model. And the reason why we're doing that is we want to have both infrastructure and application changes to occur in a consistent manner and allow us to tell a complete picture of what's changing in the system for everybody to see. That provides radical transparency as to how your SaaS is changing and allows every member of the team to actually take a look and investigate and see what happened. My change went in with this change. Okay, what could have been the impact of that? Today, all we can see is our app changes, infrastructure changes we don't have the view of in, in the same uh, context. Last thing from a behavioral perspective is really improving ownership uh, about our availability, and that's implementing error budgets for each service. Uh, as I mentioned, it really galvanizes the behavior that the development teams are accountable for operational stability. Uh, if we fall below our error budget for the month, we automatically put features on the back burner and focus on stability for that service. It really takes the guesswork out of how to prioritize feature work versus technical debt. Oh, wrong button. And so overall, cultural lessons learned. If I were to say one thing that we've learned in our two-year journey, um, just to take a step back, is executive sponsorship is required, and that's because Culture change requires vigilance. Um, it's like skateboarding. If you practice one time, you're probably not gonna be that good at it, right? You need to keep practicing these behaviors to reinforce it and drive that change, which ultimately impacts your culture. Um, we continue to practice and learn every day. The tools and processes that you use on your journey are gonna change. So you just need to accept it. This is the, the world that we live in. Um, it's part of learning and getting lean. Like I said, we use Jenkins till we had about 15 microservices and realized we can't manage the complexity anymore. We couldn't really foresee that. That's something that you learn as you go along. And if we would have saw, been able to forecast that, we wouldn't have invested all, all in Jenkins. Um, we improved our focus on the cloud and rationalized our product portfolio. More systems level thinking to understand what features across all of our products maybe make a fit as a service in our, in our uh, platform. And then lastly, changing culture by changing behaviors, empowering and trusting teams to make changes, providing them the tools and support and visibility to make them accountable for their service in production. I wanna highlight quality, availability, security, and scalability. That's everybody's job. It's one team providing the service. Uh, it's Axway team. Learning to be lean, continuous learning and practicing to get better every day, um, sharing through transparency, visibility, and measurement, and being blameless.
I want to thank everybody for joining. Um, if you guys are interested in talking deeper about our talk, uh, please reach out to us. We're on LinkedIn. Also, if you're interested in our journey along the cloud and want to join our team, we have open recs. Um, please check us out, career.axway.com. Thanks.